Mixed Seeds presents the Popcast. My name is Brian, and this is Mixed Tees Presents the Popcast. And I'm here with my friend, my partner, and my brother, Shane Montgomery. Hello, good people of planet Earth. Now, we are doing something a little different today. Uh, Shane is recording via satellite. He is remote. He is beaming in via the internet into the soundboard and uh, making his sultry voice known over the, over the internet lines. So it might be a little bit That's awkward. That's right. I am a light in the sky. A light in the sky. It might be a little awkward. Our responses might be a tad bit delayed, but um, we want to make sure you get the podcast this week, and Shane couldn't be here, so we're going to do whatever it takes for our fans. You betcha. Okay. So um, I think that uh, our fans deserve, uh, they need our review of the Justice League. I'm sorry, uh, Batman vs. Superman, Dawn of Justice. Dawn of Justice, and you're not far off. It is Justice League, and they, they deserve our... They need our review, because there's so much bad garbage out there. we got to clean it up. Yeah, I agree. Uh, it's like Justice League, uh, the prequel, or the setup, or whatever. Uh, Justice League Part 1, that's sort of what it is. Although, the, I think the next movie it's is also going being, to be called uh, Justice League Part 1. It's also being touted as Superman 2. Yeah, Man of Steel 2, I've heard that. I've heard Man of Steel 2, I've heard Batman Origins. I've heard uh, many different uh, takeaways for this movie. All of them are good, though, because whatever you want to call it, what you should call it is a great movie. Fantastic movie. It's a fantastic movie. Um, So uh, I do have this Reddit post uh, that I want to get to. Um, There was a... When I put our last podcast up, someone messaged me on reddit and uh said he didn't like the film and yada yada and so what i asked him i basically said hey man so uh tell me what you didn't like the film tell me what you didn't understand about the movie and he sent me this um pretty long response back uh before we get into that do you want to start with start with something else and then i can start reading those questions well you know i just want to say that we should talk about you know the reason why you have someone who's even complaining uh if you don't know already batman vs superman came out um the thursday before last and it came out to terrible critical reviews and the, the critics just tore it apart uh the fans were kind of on the fence i think it ended up in the 70s for rotten tomatoes and now we're down in the high 20s for critics um and so it really got lambasted and we weren't exactly sure why. Now we've had a chance to watch it. I've seen it twice now. Brian's seen it, I still think, once. Um, but we've had a chance to really go through, and we're going to show you why it's it's not as bad of a movie as, as it's been laid out. Yeah, I agree. Um, and I think that the critics have been uh, overtly um, negative about it uh, because it doesn't fit the Marvel mold, you know, the Avengers mold. It has a definitely a more grown-up feeling about it. It's... Um, I don't want to say darker or more gritty or whatever, but it just feels more... I don't want to say realistic either because it's a superhero movie, but it's definitely a more grown-up um, movie uh, that involves superheroes. It has more dialogue. It has um, a story that takes a little more effort to follow. and But I love it. I love that story. Yeah, no, it's fantastic. Also, uh, I understand that Warner Brothers had a feeling that this was coming, that there was some sort of negative reaction coming to the movie just for either people who who like uh, Marvel over DC or the fact that there was this this brew of people wanting to actually talk the movie down or or make the movie uh, seem bad and so they released it late Uh, they actually didn't give critics access to the movie until very late until initial people who came to see the movie on opening night couldn't be swayed by bad reviews and I think that uh, made them angrier and caused the review to even be a little more tweaked yeah, well, uh, Fast and Furious, the last one, that movie, um, they a month before the movie came out, they flew a bunch of the top critics, a lot of them actually, out to like Dubai 
and they put him up in a giant hotel, right, yeah. and they gave him access to the uh, you know this beautiful theater and the best food and the best, and they just, they just treat these guys like rock stars. And uh, notice that movie got fantastic reviews, even though it's not half the movie this mo- that BVS is at all. Um, it's entertaining, and that's what the, the critics couldn't didn't want to say a bad thing about it. So what they took away was, oh, it's it's a it's a wild ride. It's entertaining. It's you know they they took it for what it is because they got treated so well. I really feel like that definitely had something to do with their enthusiasm of the last Fast and Furious movie versus their enthusiasm of BVS. Oh yeah, and Dubai is is basically the the other hemisphere's um, you know version of our you know Las Vegas, New York City, LA, all combined into one. You got the largest building in the world. You've got the Gold District. You've got all kinds of amazing things that they have over there. And so they were awed by that, and that's exactly what happened. You're right. And Warner Brothers, you know, they didn't uh, they didn't play that game with the critics. And in this day and age, critics require it uh, at least some hand holding. Um, unless the movie is going to be a knockout success and nobody can talk bad about it, like uh, Star Wars was, Episode Seven. Right. All right. Uh, well, like Marvel movies are now. Now that Marvel has proven themselves, you know, it's almost as if they can do no wrong, because a Marvel movie comes out, and even if it's <clears throat> not as good as the previous Marvel movies had been, um, it's clearly you know the black sheep of its movie, and I can name a couple of them. Um, it still gets decent reviews. Like it's still not critically smashed and nitpicked to death like BVS was by a lot of different reviewers. Yeah, and they really didn't give justice to the beauty of this movie, the, no pun the intended. filmmaking quality of this movie. Yeah, they didn't they didn't give Jelly Right justice. They just didn't give enough credit um, to the director, you know, who also was the director of uh, The Watchmen, yeah. which was a really uh, good movie. Yeah, so. very stylistic movie that movie was. And I didn't even like that movie very much because, for me, personally, it was way too dark. But uh, I can respect how well that movie was made. It was shot so beautifully, so stylistic, so gritty. Um, It had so many elements that were a lot like other critics praise nowadays. Um, For me, personally, it was too dark, a little too gritty. You know, the motivations were a little too uh, extreme. But that was a personal decision. I can definitely see, still see the movie for what it is, a beautiful piece of art. Um, and that's BBS on that same vein. It's very beautiful. Um, and it's very well Well, you done. notice all, you notice, Brian, all of, of Zack Snyder's movies are pretty much like that. You can go back to, uh, he did Dawn of the Dead in 2004. He did 300 in 2006. The Watchmen in 2009. Uh, you got Sucker Punch, which wasn't that great of a movie in 2011, but it still had some great visuals. Super and stylistic. Of course, Man of Steel in 2013. Yeah, he's he just has this style about him, and either you love it, I think, or you don't love it. I mean, it's very colorful. The cinematography is always fantastic on spot. And, you know, are there a few issues of this movie? Uh, that Yes. Are hardcore comic fans uh, going to look at it and go, it's not enough, or you didn't go far enough, or you went too far? Yes, they're going to. But you got to look at the movie for the value, and you really need to go see it a second time in order to get a, a real appreciation for, you know, what was really put together here. Yeah, I completely agree. Um, so I got this Reddit post uh, in response to our last podcast. Um, you want me to go through it? Yes. Let's find out what this person had to say. Do we have his name? Yeah, his name is uh, Smigabass. I don't have his real name. It's a username. Um, Whoa, tough, Sm- tough. Well, we love Smigabass. our Reddit fans. So it's cool. Yeah. And you know, I, so I had to ask him. I said, uh, okay, so, you know, what about it um, was confusing? You know, uh, what didn't you understand? What bothered you about the movie? And I'll address it in our review. So he's going to be able to hear this now. Um, his first one was, why does Lex hate Superman? I have a couple of answers for that. I'm sure you oh, do too. Oh, goodness. Yeah, and also, you know what we might want to do before you go straight into this? We might want to give a slight overview of the movie. Just I know, and, and people know there are spoilers here. The movie's been out almost two weeks, so if you haven't seen it by now, stop what you're doing, go watch it, come back and listen. Yes, I agree with that. Yeah, don't listen to this until you've watched the movie, or you don't care about spoilers. Um, okay, yeah, here's an overview of the movie. Um, I thought the movie was fantastic. It was stylistic. Um, I loved uh, <clears throat> the real relationship that 
uh, between Clark and Lois. Um, I felt like um, while Lois didn't enti- didn't entirely have a, a huge role or place in this movie, um, they definitely shoehorned her in a little bit. I liked that their relationship felt... She had a lot of screen time, though. Yeah, a lot of screen time, yeah. I felt like the, the, her and Clark's relationship were def- was definitely um, uh, more real. It felt more, you know, it didn't feel forced like in the first movie. First movie def- definitely felt a little rushed, a little forced. Um, Agree. I like that. Uh, people people talk like they, like they don't like Lex. I liked Lex's character. I liked um, Eisenberg in that role. I normally don't like Eisenberg as an actor, uh, but in this situation, I thought it was perfect. He was playing a pre- crazy pre-villain um, uh, Lex Luthor and uh, he was still crazy he was still eccentric because he's a tech billionaire he's Mark Zuckerberg in this movie basically which is ironic because he played Mark Zuckerberg in the social network um, but he definitely <laughs> yeah he definitely had a he had that that, that vibe about him like this is before the crazy villain Lex Luthor this is the you know uh, egomaniacal sort of eccentric Lex with his own set of issues and troubles, um, but you can definitely see that crazy coming out of him. But it's not full, it's not full, full you know, full gone yet, um, which is what I liked about it. I love Batman. Uh, Bruce Wayne was, fa- I'm sorry, uh, Ben Affleck is fantastic as Bruce Wayne. He was great as the Batman. Um, I loved Alfred. I loved it. Uh, he was so great. I loved how they explained the voice manipulator thing. That was awesome uh, because a lot of people had a problem with that in the in the, in the Nolan films, and. Um, uh, I even like Wonder Woman. I thought she was fantastic in the party. I thought her her, uh, her performance was a tad bit wooden in other areas, but um, at the party it was great. Uh, in the action scenes it was great. She wasn't in the movie that very often. Um, I loved the cameos. Uh, I loved all the cameos except for maybe the cyber cameo was a little uh, a little t- too TV for my liking. But uh, I'm not sure what else you could have done with a minute long cameo, so I'll take it. Um, and I love the I love how they were, they were able to fit two of the most famous comic books of all time into one movie, and uh, do it um, and do it where it felt natural and it felt grown up and it didn't feel like a bunch of punchlines and explosions. You know, I loved it. What two comics are those? World's Finest, Batman vs Superman, and the Death of Superman. Okay, awesome. Um, well, I will say that the movie starts out with uh, actually it's a. It's kind of a the end of Superman uh, Returns, so end of Superman One, and you're seeing Superman um, fighting the other Kryptonians. You mean Man of Steel? And uh, I'm sorry, Man of Steel. You're right. Apologize. And he's basically fighting the other uh, Kryptonians and making a mess of Metropolis. Uh, you see Bruce Wayne land in his helicopter, and he's basically trying to, you know, rush to the to aid the people in his building. And uh, and you have this moment where it comes down, and you see that pain, and that Ben Affleck's really able to portray. And so the movie starts out immediately with you know people questioning Superman and whether his help is worth the uh, the collateral damage that that comes from there. So what so that's kind of the, the setup of the movie and how you end up with this struggle between Batman and Superman, and you've got basically uh, Lex Luthor trying to you know antagonistic make it come to a point where it's actually a boiling water. So, yeah, we want to take it from there. Yeah, um, and uh, <clears throat> that that antagonist uh, behavior is the first question that Mr. Smigboss on Reddit asks. He says, "Why does Lex hate Superman?" And I think I know the answer. Um, if you know the answer, it's great too. I think he hates Superman because Superman is a messiah figure. He is all powerful. Um, he's he's more powerful than Lex, and I think that uh, Lex's plans to eventually dominate the world, even if they're noble at first, uh, will definitely be um, questioned by the all-powerful being that can stop him at any moment. And uh, I think that Superman represents something that threatens Lex because Lex can't beat Superman. Superman's bigger, powerful, more stronger, and so alien to him. So I think he's, that scares Well, what's him. interesting, what's interesting about that is that you just, what you said, he's bigger, he's stronger, he's alien to him, which alludes to something Lex said in the movie, where he basically scoffed at his father uh, being a monster, 
And so maybe there's some sort of way that he relates to that where also his father was bigger, stronger, and uh, an alien to him. Right. So that's why I think he hates Superman. He sees a threat, not a threat to the world, maybe, but maybe a threat to Lex and Lex's plans for the future. I agree with that. Uh, another question. He says, why does Lana throw the spear in the water? You want to answer that question? I'm assuming he's talking about Lois Lane. Lana Lane is in Smallville, so yes. he, uh, I think he's talking about Lois. Yeah, okay. he's talking about Lois. Um, Lois, yeah. You know, you and I have talked offline about this quite a bit, and you know, I do think that her throwing the spear in the water was was used as a plot device. If I was gonna if I was gonna force a reason for it to happen, it has to be, you know, hey, you know, Superman is the man she loves. She wants that thing to be as far away from him as possible, and so she's looking for a place to get rid of it. She threw it once first, and then when she got the opportunity, she was really gonna get rid of it. And she actually hesitates for a second, unsure of where to put it, before she throws it into that into that pool. It was the pool, or was it the 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 water in between the two cities. Do you know what that yeah, was? Yeah, a pit. It was like a pit full of water. I don't know. Yeah, so she's obviously trying to get rid of it. And, you know, she... It's what any person who loves another person that something's hurting them, they would want to get rid of it. So I see that justification uh, for her doing that. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, so that answers that question. Uh, the next question he asks, why does Lana think to go back and get it? Uh, again, he's, he's referring to Lois, but... He's, he said Lana. So going forward, I'm just going to replace all the Lanas in this long list of Lana questions to Lois because he is talking about Lois. So I think the reason she went back to get it was obviously she had come to the conclusion that uh, they were going to need need it, and she's the one who threw it away, so she knows where it is. Um, I didn't like that part of the movie, actually. I didn't feel like Lois should play that pivotal pivotal of a role. Uh, but the reason she did come back was because they needed a plot device to be able to get Batman and her together. So she goes in after the the spear. Uh, everything crumbles down on her, and uh, Superman has to save her. That's another problem because Superman's able to hear Lois knocking during midst all this fighting. A little bit of an issue, but he couldn't tell his mom was getting kidnapped. So I don't know. I'm uh, that's a little bit of a problem that people are seeing in the world, but. They had to put her back in that pool so that her and Superman could have that moment where he could say goodbye uh, before he goes off to fight um, Doomsday. Yeah, I think you're right. I think it was a little bit of a plot device to see, uh, to show the audience um, this moment and to give Lois uh, some type of closure before this event in which Superman fights Doomsday in a very weakened state. And I think that was important to the story. And I think that in order to force that moment, you know, it felt a little forced, but I think it was necessary. <clears throat> and I'm not going to nitpick about it either. Also, if I can add one other thing here, you know, something people don't realize is that Warner Brothers authorized, I want to say, an additional $100 million in reshoots for this movie. So what does that tell you? It tells you, I can tell you, Zack Snyder didn't want to go do reshoots for the movie. So Warner Brothers only authorizes that movie because they're telling Zack Snyder, hey, we need this, we need this for future movie, you need to do this. So the studio did a lot of telling him what to do. Plus the movie was cut down by 30 minutes from the original vision. So people who are saying it's too, you know, that, that things are jumbled and they don't, you know, some of this has to fall in the studio if there are problems with it. Yeah, I agree. And I can't wait to watch uh, the ultimate edition uh, with 30 more minutes and rated R, because that's going to be, for someone that liked the movie, that's going to be fantastic. <clears throat> I agree. All right, so that question was uh, pretty much answered. Uh, next question is also about Lois. He goes, so really, if Lana, I mean, uh, Lois, is in danger anywhere in the world at any time, does Superman come to her rescue? I would say. Well, that's good. I think you have that answer. Yeah, uh, yes, he does. Um, and if you're in a relationship, if you have a, a wife or a husband, and uh, <clears throat> you can be there at any time when they're in danger, would you? The answer is yes. Um, if, my, if I had the ability to be near omnipresent on this planet, and my wife was in danger, I knew she was in a dangerous situation, and uh, 
maybe I'm maybe I know she's going to this uh, terrorist organization. Maybe I'm definitely listening in. I'm worried about her. So when things get out of hand, I'm definitely going to show up. That is the woman I love. I'm going to show up. That's a good point. And I'm going to kick butt. I'm going to save my woman. And I'm going to get brownie points for it. That's the plan. I mean. <laughs> You're going to get a shower scene or a bath bath scene or something? Right, a bath. I'm going to get a bath scene for that. For sure. I mean, that's <clears throat> what 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 uh, significant other wouldn't save their significant other if they had the chance to. So, of course, he would. Maybe he's a little stocky about it, but he knows she's going into a dangerous area. So I, I, that wasn't no, far-fetched really at all. Point. The only thing I would say, and this is the – is, and some people are alluding to it. I, I think people, especially guys, when they're going to watch a superhero movie, they tend to have a problem when, you know, you've got your, your buddy Superman and his girl Lois Lane and they're suck-facing in the corner. It gets to be a little uncomfortable and while the relationship is necessary, the building of it, there seems to be a whole lot of Lois Lane in this movie with Superman. And her being there at the end with, with uh, at the last fight um, is, is difficult for me to process. It's almost too much. But then again, I wasn't a comic book guy. Um, but I'll say, I'll say this. Hit her, not... Um, him, him saving her every time something happens is interesting, but how come he didn't hear when his mother was being um, kidnapped? Well, that's a good question. Maybe he didn't know to listen. His mother's working at a diner somewhere in Smallville, Kansas. Uh, he probably assumes that she's safe. Um, while Lois Lane is scheduled, he works with her. She, he knows that she's going to this terrace cell out in the middle of the desert somewhere, uh, <clears throat> and it's a dangerous place. Um, like I said, I think that um, if my wife was going uh, into a dangerous interview, I would want to be nearby uh, just in case. And as Superman, he has the ability to be nearby at any moment. Um, yeah, I, I, I think that you have something there, especially in that situation. Um, do you think so? Would you say that maybe he just got her tuned in? So anytime something's happening with her, he just kind of, you know, you know, tuned into her frequency? Yeah, I mean, the same way we tune into our wife's frequency when, when I can hear my wife in the other room when I have my headphones on you know uh, saying my name it's uh, other people other people at work I work with when my headphones are on and they're four feet away they have to actually get into my eyesight to get my attention so there's some kind of a there's something there there's definitely a tune in factor when it comes to your significant other I definitely think that's the case that's true what do you think about the tapping? You know, he heard that what it was. He heard the, her, he heard her tapping trapped underneath the water, and she was tapping on the concrete. Yeah, that so, that um, might be a stretch. I mean, she was also screaming right a couple of times before the tapping. That's happened. true. I guess we just didn't hear. They should have let us hear that in his mind instead of just the tapping. Right. Yeah. They should. Yeah. Could hear. You know, in his mind, he hears ah, whatever the screaming is. Maybe. Um, I don't know. Like I said, that's that's definitely one of the looser connections in the movie that is yet to be explained uh, or ever explained. Maybe they do. Maybe they do explain that he's tuned into Lois's frequency, you know? Um, that would explain yeah, a maybe, lot. but if that's a low point, that's one of very few low points. Yeah, it's, a, it's very, yeah, like I said, that's one of very few low points in the movie. And I think that that would actually explain a lot with Superman over the last 80 years because he's always sort of been there to rescue Lois. So... Yeah, I would love to hear how that, how that works and what that is. They'd effectively, effectively be explaining something that that comic book fans and fans of the of Superman in general have complained about for a few decades. You know, how he's always known to rescue Lois Lane. Maybe he's just tuned into it, you know? Uh, remember in the first Man of Steel, uh, <clears throat> his mom was saying, block out the noise when he was a kid. He's learning how to he use his hearing, his super hearing, right? Block out the noise. Imagine an island. You know, go to it. You know, maybe he can sort of tune out. He has to tune out the rest of the world, right? So he can sort of tune in to other things. I could totally see that being a Yeah, thing. I would love to just hear that. I would love to hear and find out how that works. and Because that's always been something that sort of bugged me about how he just kind of knew. And I understand that it was a TV plot thing or it was, a, you know, it was fun that Superman was just all of a sudden always there. But it would be kind of nice to know what that's about. Right. I'm assuming it has something to do with his ability to tune out and tune in to certain things. Because uh, in, in Man of Steel, remember when he goes, he goes up into the atmosphere and he can hear people talking on the ground like he has insane hearing. 
Um, I could see him definitely tuning in to certain things. That's my theory. I'm not sure if it's legit, but hopefully they address that. Good theory. Okay. Um, uh, this, last question, this next question is about Batman. It says, for a movie that depends so much on the audience being aware of the universe, did we really need to have a Batman origin again? And I got to say, that wasn't really much of a Batman origin. So uh, it was the title. I thought, I thought it was done beautifully, by the way. That they opened up the title sequence of the movie, and in the title sequence of the movie, in that few minutes, they managed to get the entire Batman origin out, and they do it stylistically, like Kubrick-esque stylistic choices, where they almost mimic frames in the comic books um, in order to tell this the Batman origin story without having to use any time for the movie. It's literally in the title sequence. It's really well done. Yeah, and if you don't know what Kubrick-esque means, then go ahead and look up Stanley Kubrick, and go watch a couple movies, most notably you probably know The Shining, uh, 2001 and 2010 Space Odysseys, and uh, A Clockwork Orange, and you'll understand some of that stylized and real the beauty he pulls out of his shots. Yeah, so I that's the question I answer. I don't think that they did uh, spend any time on the origin. They used the title sequence to explain the origin, so that's okay because maybe some of the audience you know, didn't know uh, the Batman origin, which that's, I'm, I'm not sure that most of them did, but maybe also, maybe he wanted to use the title sequence to explain the origin um, in that stylistic choice to sort of set the tone for the movie. Here's the style of the movie right here. Well, and I would love for people to who are hardcore comic fans to stop thinking that they made these movies for you, or this movie was made for for you specifically. There's a lot of people who didn't follow the comics that are just fans of the superheroes that have watched the movies and want to be a part of it, but don't understand the whole thing. They need to be included into how the movies, you know, into into appreciating the movie. It can't be just a fanboy flick. So, you know, we need we got Superman's uh, origin story in in the first movie, and now in this movie we got Batman's origin. And you know what? We're going to get the rest of the Justice League's origins too. And, you know, so don't cry about it. And we got it in a three-minute title sequence. It didn't take away from the story. I mean, it just didn't. Um, if anything, it added No, and it to added it. to it, and it yeah. tied it to the end. Exactly, and it tied it to the end. Exactly. So I liked it, and uh, I don't think that they wasted any time on that origin. Okay, so the next question is, the entire Wonder Woman intro is clumsy. She takes the hard drive and then just gives it back? Question mark? That's exactly what she does. So he's... <laughs> He's talking about Gal Gadot. Um, that's exactly what she did, but there's a good reason. You got it. Yeah. Um, she takes the hard drive when she's following Bruce Wayne around. She obviously knows about Bruce Wayne. Um, takes the hard drive because the hard drive has a picture of her that will out her as an immortal being. It's an old, old vintage picture from a couple hundred years ago, or whatever, 150 years ago, of her... Uh, looking the exact same age in her Wonder Woman outfit, and she doesn't want Lex to have it. Her idea is to delete that thing from the hard drive before Bruce Wayne gets it. What happens is uh, she can't open the, the hard drive. It's it's uh, encrypted. She knows that the one person besides Lex that can decrypt this thing is Bruce Wayne, and so she gives it back to him because she can't open it. She can't pop it on her laptop and, and browse the files. And she needs the bat, the super bat computer or whatever. So she gives it back to Bruce Wayne, you know? And, and probably a good faith message saying, hey, here's, you know, here's the hard drive. Do what you will with it. And in that same good faith, he sends a, that picture back to her. And with, with us, so some other files as well. But that's why she gave it back. She gave it back because she couldn't open it. It's that simple. She didn't know it was decrypted. Well, and I think also you got to remember that they're building a rapport between these characters, and 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 so you need to build some sort of teamwork effort here, so that when you come to the final scene and you see, you know, Batman gets saved, but his life is saved by Wonder Woman in this movie, and when she comes in and you think, oh my gosh, Superman came back and just saved Batman. No, it was Wonder Woman. But you need that rapport to get built. You know, you had to have some way for them to come back and forth with each other. So that was not weird. I mean, you know, how else would they have done it? Were they in a relationship with each other or something? It just wouldn't have worked that way. No, this was the most natural way to do it, in my opinion. Okay, uh, next question is, how or why is Lex finding the metahumans? Hmm, well, 
What do you think? Who cares? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if I am a billionaire and I'm obsessed with power and I know that there is metahumans on this planet, um, I might devote some of my resources to finding and learning more about how and and why and where they come from and how they work, et cetera, et cetera. And I don't think that, that uh, knowing that motivation um, is even necessary, really. Uh, it seems pretty obvious to me. And uh, the why of it also seems pretty, pretty obvious to me. I don't feel like it needed to be explained. He's a tech billionaire. He's fascinated with these metahumans, as anybody should be, which is why we're watching this movie in the first place. Anybody that's watching the movie is fascinated with superhuman beings. Everybody is so well, and you're gonna you're gonna find out in the next movie, anyways. I mean, it's basically a, a setup for the next movie, and you're gonna find out. You know, I, I believe you'll find out why he's looking for him. I mean, it's obviously in preparation for the Justice League. I mean, there are just some questions that that you don't need to ask. You just you know you have to have a little bit of faith, um, and not everything that happens in a movie needs to be thoroughly explained. Uh, so that to you know, it's you just have right. to believe that it's going in the right direction. Right. Well, just like Star Wars. I mean, I have questions about Star Wars that I pray is going to be answered in the next movie. You know, who's Ray's? Yeah, father? nobody gave him bad reviews. Where's Lex been? I mean, not Lex. Uh, Luke. Uh, what's up with Han and Solo? What happened with their relationship? I mean, there's so many questions that I'm assuming will be answered at some point in future movies because there are going to be three or four of these Justice League movies. So. Yes, there's going to be things that are, is not going to be answered until the next movie. That's Marvel movies do that, and now DC movies do that. Every movie does that. I mean, that that is building a franchise, and that's okay. Okay, absolutely. So the next question: uh, logo for each hero is funny. Guess Lex will design their suits too. Lol? Question mark. He's being sarcastic about the second question. But basically, he's saying um, Lex designed the logos for the metahumans, and I have a wonderful theory. Uh, about <clears throat> why he designed those logos. So in the is that because you saw it on the computer screen? Yeah, he, on the computer screen, there's those four logos that show Wonder Woman, Cyborg, the Flash, and Aquaman. And there's okay, there's icons on the folders. So the Wonder Woman icon is basically a W, right? The Cyborg icon is a C, right? And the um, the Flash icon is a lightning bolt. And they're all simple, simple versions of their logos, basically. And the last one, Aquaman, is the the A-looking thing, right? Um, it's not A; it's like an upside-down triangle. So this is really, really easy because in all of the, in, in the Aquaman and the Flash and the Wonder Woman cameos, Wonder Woman has a W on her chest. Okay, in the picture that that, that proves that she exists, she has a W on her chest, and in the Aquaman cameo, um, he has the upside down triangle on his belt. So boom, those are those are covered. The cyborg is the definition of a cyborg. It's a human, human half human half machine. The definition of that cyborg. Let's give that give that folder a C. And when the Flash interrupts that that uh, that liquor store robbery, he takes off in the lightning bolt effects. You know, all those those lightning is all around him. So whoever designed nice that logo, effect. I like that. You know, whatever it is, whoever designed that logo, give him a lightning bolt. I'm a designer, and if I had designed folder icons for these uh, for Lex Luthor, these these might be my choices. It's not far fetched. I mean, I don't understand why it's such a huge. That's a, that's a problem that the reviewers keep picking on. Like, oh, where do the icons come from? One of his one of his designers designed the icons. I mean, it's that simple. Wow. Well, it's people looking for problems is what this is. When you ask questions like that, you're looking for reasons to talk down the movie. Uh, you're, the guy's probably uh, a Marvel fan and, you know, doesn't want competition from this DC universe. And that's silly because there's always been Marvel and DC, uh, you know, and there's enough room for both in, in our world. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, so that's my theory on the logos, and uh, I don't know what else they would have done with the logos. Maybe just like folders that say like really uh, old uh, chick in armor. I mean, I don't know. I'm not sure how they could have possibly have um, done that so the audience can see what what we we're looking at. So that's a good choice in my opinion. Okay, 
All right, so the last question, there's a lot more questions. I'm gonna, this, this is going to be the last question because I realize there's too many questions here for me to answer. Pick a good one. Um, <clears throat> this one. I've, I've seen this, this brought up with other reviewers and online a couple hundred times, so I'm going to pick this question. How does Batman go from years of anger and hatred to best friends forever because of the word Martha? Mm. Years? It was two years, 18 months that this took. Right, he said years. So I think he's off by the years things, but it's not been, it has been years, but I guess a couple years. So how did Batman go from a couple years of anger and hatred to best friends with Superman because of Martha? Okay, well, do you want me to, let's see here. So this is what I think. Um, Bruce Wayne lost people in his building and he blamed Superman, and that made him angry. Um, I think he continued, that, that anger built over over time as things happened, and you got to remember that um, Lex Luthor is, is pushing Batman's buttons. But in the heart of it all, he, he knows, Batman knows, that what Superman is doing is overall for good. So as angry as he is, he's not only angry about Superman, He's angry about the death of Robin. He's angry that bad guys have taken down the good guys. And he, this, we're seeing a much more cynical and more judicious Batman than we've ever seen. So Superman is part of the problem. And in the end, when, when the whole Martha thing ends up coming up, they're both of their mother's names are Martha. And I think he stops, it stops him in his tracks. I mean, he is a deeply, emotionally distraught person over what happened with his parents. And I think it stopped him in his tracks, and he had to kind of figure out what this man was saying, what Superman was saying. I don't think they were best friends. I don't think they were giving each other a hug and swap and spit. You know, they <laughs> were, uh, they knew they had something to do, you know? Right, and you know what? Um, it's not... I mean, yes, it's coincidence that, that both their names are mother, uh, Martha. But remember this. Um, that was never for storytelling purposes before. Martha Wayne was his mother's name in the comic books, in history of, the, of, history of Batman. That was, his, that was her name. And it happened to also be whoever wrote Clark's uh, Superman's uh, comic books also used that name for Martha Kent. Tying that together in this movie was fantastic. Showing the origin, that little two-minute origin at the beginning of the movie, was fantastic. Reminding the audiences that that was her name, right? Before the two-and-a-half-hour yeah, event, right? And it, what it also did was it took this god that I think that he's angry and I think he's afraid of Superman because Superman, like he says to Alfred, he can burn the world down. You know, if this guy ever decided to stop being a good guy and started being a bad guy, that's it. It's over. Humanity is done, Right. So in his head, this guy is a god. He's a god who is who unchecked by anybody, and Batman's going to check this dude, right? Whether, whether, whether he likes it or not, he's going to check this dude because he's afraid of what he can do. I think when the reveal happens, where he reveals that, that Martha's in trouble and that Martha's his mother, that takes Superman from this godlike being who can burn the world down to somebody's son, to a man. It takes him from Superman to man and shows that he is a person with a mother and a father and a girlfriend and a job. And he is a regular guy with superhuman abilities. And that changes the thought process for Batman. Batman realizes that maybe even though he's all this all powerful and he could be a threat, uh, maybe it's not as uh, dire of a situation and that this man before him. Um, needs help just like every other up needs help. And I think it takes Batman back to a time before he grew so angry and cynical and it sort of wakes him up a little bit. <clears throat> I think that's what that scene exactly. does. Exactly. I think you just nailed that. No, I think you just nailed that. I think that it took him back. Um, you're seeing a, a Batman who is basically taking out everything on this fight with Superman. He's put every bad thing into it. And, and what a fight! Kind of, Leads him to it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was a good fight. Yeah, and Alfred does. Alfred does warn him about this in the first place. Alfred is the, he's the voice of reason for Batman. And uh, I think some of that, some of that's got to come back to him too when he realizes that, hey, he's about to kill someone's son. You know, someone's, you know, 
boyfriend, someone, a man, a person. So I think that changes a lot. And uh, that was my opinion. I think that's a, that, that's a great question to end on because that's a question a lot of people have been bringing up. And I want to say that I liked I the movie. There were some things I didn't like about it. But there's also something, some things I didn't like about Age of Ultron. And there's some things I didn't like about, a lot of things I didn't like about Thor. And some things I didn't like about Iron Man 2 and Man of Steel. And you name it, there are going to be problems with movies, <clears throat> no matter how you shake it. There's, there are problems with movies that you watch. Um, if they're minimal enough and the, the positives outweigh the negatives, it makes it a good film. And in my opinion, this movie was fantastic. It was on that level of Kubrick. It was very stylistic, very dialogue-driven. It's about 30% action to 70% um, story, which is a nice change to the typical Marvel movies, which, is, which I like too. But they're like 70% action to 30% story, you know? You get a lot more action, you do story, you got a lot more punchlines, a lot more comedy, and that's all good. That's the kind of movie, you want to watch that kind of movie at the time, that's the movie you're going to watch. This movie is not a Marvel movie. This is a DC movie, and they've separated themselves from the pack and shown we're making grown-up movies. Come watch this grown-up, more adult, more mature version of a superhero flick. And um, if you don't like that, then fine. But see it for what it is, you know, uh, instead of downplaying it, because it's not a Marvel movie. Because it's not. It's not a Marvel movie. No, it's 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 very artistically put together. If you enjoy movie making and you enjoy the theatrical presence of a film and what it can really do, then that's what Zack Snyder's brought here. You know, a lot of people complained about just, just the storyline. And they didn't like... Um, they didn't like the final fight scene. Uh, they didn't like the fact that uh, they forced Superman, and they didn't like that the bad guy, that Lex Luthor, was able to um, use Zod's body to create um, Doomsday. That's been a big criticism. And But what people don't understand is that in order to get the Justice League formed, Superman has to die. I mean, that's the way it happens in the comics, and it's the way it needed to happen in order for them to have a reason to bring the metahumans together. Otherwise, you know, you don't need them if you've got Superman. Right. So don't be so hardcore on the Doomsday thing. And yes, you know, Lex Luthor, he created Bizarro, which, but it just wouldn't have worked. And a lot of people are saying we should it should have been Bizarro. That would have been fine. Let Lex Luthor create. But Lex Luthor did not create Doomsday. Doomsday is a pre, pre-Krypton pre um, creature. Yeah, he's a so, prehistoric Kryptonian. Yeah, so uh, totally understandable why you feel that way, but you don't have a Justice League movie without it, and Zack Snyder did not want to skip Doomsday completely, because it's an, inter it's an integral part of the most famous comic of all time. So it had to happen, you needed it in there, and maybe it felt a little forced, but it had to happen in order for you to get the Justice League. So give him some forgiveness. Yeah, and I think that uh, we need to remember that not all the audience are comic book nerds um, and not all the audience <clears throat> needs I mean, the, the movie doesn't need to follow the comics precisely. In fact, even Marvel movies don't. Remember, Tony Stark didn't create Ultron in the comic books. It was Hank Pym, who you didn't even see until after that movie came out. You didn't even know of his existence. That's a good point. So com the, the DCU and the MCU are different from the comic book universe. You know, there are variations, and some of the variations are because of business and license rights, and some are just simple, simple stylistic choices and story choices that they need to do in order to drive a movie uh, story, because a movie story is different from a comic book. You have 37 issues of, of the Justice League where it explains the, the, <clears throat> the Doomsday issue. But you have one movie, you know, and you're going to have a, a limited amount of movies and getting that story into this movie, I thought it was done fantastically. And if you had to switch the origin of him a little bit, that's OK. Maybe that's the Doomsday Lex makes, but it's not the, doom, the actual Doomsday. We don't know yet because in the comic books, there is a Doomsday version that Lex makes and it's a weaker version of Doomsday. And the Doomsday that comes from, from Krypton is a much more powerful version of Doomsday than the entire league has to fight at one point. So you don't know which version of Doomsday that was. But there are multiple versions of Doomsday. So who knows which one that was? And it's okay to, to, to drive it in the story. 
Hey, I'd love to hear what you think about, uh, you know, we got the introduction of Wonder Woman. What did you think about that? I liked it. Um, they couldn't do much more with it. This is not a Wonder Woman movie. Um, having her fight with them at the end was fantastic. If, if that's what the Wonder Woman, movie, Wonder Woman movie is going to be like, then I sign me up. She was so great in her the way she fought and the style of her fighting, which is so <clears throat> aggressive and like in your face and just like she even smiled a little bit. Remember that at, that <clears throat> that moment where she gets knocked down? She gets knocked like not down. She gets knocked like a few blocks away by uh, Doomsday. And she gets up and she wipes up blood off her lip and does a little smile and then charges back into the fight. And I was like, that. Yeah. That is that. Wonder Woman. That is great. That is Wonder Woman from the comic books. At the, that is Wonder Woman coming off the page and into the movie. That's exactly the kind of Wonder Woman we want to see on screen. Um, initially, when they when they had it, showed her in the dress and that whole thing, I was like, she should be a little more awkward. But remember, the DCU and the, and the comic books are a little different. In the comic books, she'd be a little more awkward, not really understanding the how... Uh, the world works because she's been sheltered for so long on this island. But in the movie universe, she's Diana Prince, ambassador. She's been around for hundreds of years. She knows how man's universe works. She might not agree with them, but she but she she knows how the man's world works. Man, when I'm saying man, I'm saying the, the rest of the world. That's not Themyscira. So <laughs> nice, good way to clean that up. Um, so I like the way. Well, that's what they call in in the comic books. They call it man's world because they're all women on that island. But it's not the same in the movie. So it's different in the movie. And I like this version of Wonder Woman. And I felt like they definitely captured her. And it was showed a lot in the fight scene. Like it was, I loved seeing that lasso being used. It was really good stuff, man. How about the music for Wonder Woman? Was that not awesome? Oh. Like that Amazonian, like, j be the jungle beating drums and just, nah, 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 yeah, that electric guitar. Wasn't that amazing? It was so good. It was, I, I really hope that this, the per whoever scored this movie is going to be scoring the rest of these films because if if that's the, if they use the same score, the score style in the Wonder Woman standalone, oh, man, that movie's going to be sick. Oh, he's going to be great, man. And Chris yeah. Pine's in it, bro. Oh, God. Sign me up. Oh, yeah. He's in the picture. You can see him in the picture in next the picture, to it. It's a nice yeah. little Easter egg. You brought that to my attention. I was like, what? Yeah, it was pretty awesome. And uh, I really hope that I love the two the two music uh, beds that they use. The part where Lex Luthor, every time he's going through the process, when he was going through the process of getting access to the Kryptonian ship, that whole music scene, uh, the way they did that almost as a montage was perfect it's absolutely i mean i couldn't get it out of my head that and the wonder woman fighting scenes were fantastic yeah it's really really good um so i'm with you man i think we're on the same page i can't wait for the next movie uh, i'm glad that that uh that report that Zack snyder had left the justice league was an april fool's joke because oh my god i was getting pissed uh on april it was 1st. april fools it was april oh, fools. It, oh wow i missed that on april 1st he tweeted out so uh, a report came out on Latino Review, which is a, a very uh, well-known source for these movies, um, that he was leaving the franchise. And then he tweeted, and I thought, oh, it's just nonsense. They're just messing with us. Then he tweeted that, you know, good luck to George Miller, you know, the guy that did um, uh, Fury Road, Mad Max. Good luck to him. He's, right. he's taking over the Justice League franchise. You know, uh, there's a lot, you know, it's been a very tiring event for me. You know, I'm going to, I'm taking, I'm taking my leave. And I was like, "What? What? What?" I was I was getting angry because I'm like, "The fan, uh, these reviewers are forcing this amazing director out of this franchise." And I, I mean, at least they're getting George Miller, which is another very stylistic director. But then the next day, uh, it was all joke. It was all an April Fool's joke, and they start filming the Justice League in um, in July. So, woo, that was close. Woo. Yeah, I would have actually been mad. I think. I think. <laughs> I think I would have called somebody. Wait a second. You can't. I know people are calling for Zack Snyder's head, but don't listen to those people. Please. No, they don't know what they're talking about. I got to say, though, if they were going to go with a different director, at least it would be George Miller. It would be another very stylistic choice and not, you know, <laughs> the guy that wrote, that guy that directed Fast and Furious 4 or whatever. You know what I mean? Yeah, I mean, you can't go wrong with, with Mad Max. That was, that was pretty great. Very stylistic. Okay, well, that's it for the review for me. I don't know if you got anything else. Well, um, I've got a little letter. Do you want to talk about that? Ooh, I love the letters, man. I love the letters. 
All right, so this is a fan email, and uh, you know, if you guys want to email us and ask us questions, make fun of us, or uh, get us to talk about one of your topics, you can always send us an email to what's our email address again? Popcast at mixtees.com. So you got it there, popcast at mixtees.com. Okay, so this letter is from Greg Little. He's from San Diego, California. And he says, Dear podcast, dear Popcast team, I've been listening to your superhero suite of podcasts, and you guys didn't really talk about any of the villains that could really give that really give superheroes their balance. Do you plan on covering Lex Luthor or the Joker or any of the other famous DC villains? I'd love to hear a show about how and why they were created. I'm worried about the dawn of justice, Lex Luthor. He seems scrawny. What do you think? Well, uh, I sort of answered that already, but let me get into more detail. I think that Lex Luthor is, right now, in this movie, a scrawny, young, tech billionaire. And he is pre-criminal. He is pre-prison, man. This guy is a programmer, tech genius, that built this, you know, that actually didn't even build a company, that has brought his company into the 21st century with his brilliance. But he is the Mark Zuckerberg of the DCU. What happens is, he's going to prison. And they show that scene where they're shaving his head. And what do you do when you're in prison? What What is the only thing you have to do in prison besides sleep? And that's work out. And this guy's going to work out. He's going to beef up. He's going to decide he likes the bald look. And by the time we see him again outside of prison, we're going to see a much calmer, uh, a much more reserved, uh, a much buffer Lex Luthor that knows that he's done his time and he's got to hide his crazy a little bit more because people are wary of his actions now that he is a convict. Yeah, that's a good point. I think they're going to, it'll be interesting to see if uh, Jesse Eisenberg can actually put some muscle on that frame of his <laughs> and he might actually get some Oscar nod if he can actually pull off, you know, the change of Lex Luthor like that. Yeah, that'd be great. I mean, there's plenty of guys that lose a bunch of weight or gain a bunch of weight. Um, but I don't know of a whole lot of guys that are beefing up from that small to, you know, big, big hunk of guy in a uh, for a roll. So if he can pull it off, it's going to be great. And I hope that they keep him. I hope they yeah, keep I got a question for you. No, they got to keep him because if they if they don't, uh, it's going to mess up the continuity. So that would be a real disappointment. I know a lot of people don't like Eisenberg as Lex Luthor, but I think you explained it really well that we're getting pre-Lex Luthor, Lex Luthor. Let's just call it that. pre the Lex Luthor we know from the comics. I think that's what you're getting here. And um, I wanted to ask you if you could go ahead and I would love you to... I think that Ben Affleck did a pretty good job as Batman. I was wondering if you would rank uh, all the Batmans from your, like, one through... What is it? Four or five now. Well, in my opinion, I think that Bruce Wayne... I'm sorry, Ben Affleck, to date, is the best version of Bruce Wayne. And if I had to rank them, I would say... <clears throat> Ben Affleck, and then I would go to Michael Keaton as number two, and then I would say um, Christian Bale as number three, and for number four, I'd probably go mm, Val Kilmer, number five, I would go uh, the other guy, the handsome guy, what's his name? George something. George Clooney? George Clooney. So yeah, in that George word, Clooney, yes sir. I'd go Ben Affleck, Michael Keaton, Christian Bale, Val Kemmer, George Clooney, because Val Kemmer, that movie has sucked, but he did a really good Bruce Wayne. When he when he was playing Bruce Wayne, it was a much more believable Bruce Wayne than George Clooney, even though George Clooney is like the embodiment of Bruce Wayne. You know, that movie just came off as, he just came off as so, uh, too nice um, uh, for me. And I love Michael Keaton, so I gotta get Michael Keaton the, the number two slot, because he, uh, he shouldn't have been as good as he was. Because it just doesn't fit his personality, but he was. He was fantastic. So Ben Affleck, Michael Keaton, Christian Bale, Val Kilmer, George Clooney. That's my ranking. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and give you mine really quick because I was thinking about it. Now, I actually have Michael Keaton as number one for me. It's maybe because it was my first introduction to the Batman movies. He'll always be number one in my heart. Uh, then I go Ben Affleck, number two. Number three, same as yours, uh, Christian Bale. Uh, my number four is actually George Clooney. I'm a huge Val Kilmer fan especially from Tombstone and some of his earlier work. But uh, he was the least engaging uh, actor to me, so he would go as number five for me. So that's my my number five, my uh, my top five. Yeah, I feel like it's a toss-up a little bit between George Clooney and Val Kilmer because those movies were so 
bad. It's hard to watch They're the bad, taste yeah. out of your mouth and focus on the Bruce Wayne moments because um, there wasn't a whole lot of them. Um, so they're 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 you know they're they're similar levels. Um, when I said four Val Kilmer, five George Clooney, it's a close five to that four. You know what I mean? It's a close four to that right. five. <laughs> yeah. you know, it's it's not, almost like four and four. Right. It's yeah. It's on that same level. It's like yeah. And uh, last would be these two. You know. <clears throat> Nice, yeah. Well, that's it for me, man. How are we going to wrap it up? Yeah, I think that's all I have. Yeah, that's all I have. If you want to tell them how they can get to us. Well, this has been the podcast presented by Mixed Tees, and you can find us at mixedtees.com slash the podcast. You can also get us at rawrant.com in the audio version. You can find us on Twitter at twitter.com slash mixed tees, facebook.com slash mixed tees. You can email us at podcast at mixed tees.com. And uh, you can get uh, through Stitcher and iTunes. You can get the audio version of this because of Raw Rant. So I can't wait to see you guys next week. I hope you guys have enjoyed this review or review of the reviews. And uh, next week, who knows what we'll be talking about. Yeah, and I do want to be, give a big shout-out to our Reddit fans. We have a lot of fans on Reddit, and uh, we appreciate all of your guys' comments. And uh, keep it coming. Keep us on our toes. Yes, please. Ask the questions. Criticize the show. We like to hear it. And we'll see you guys next week.